Hello everyone, welcome to week 15. We're talking about foreign policy. It's our last week of the course um, and we've come a long way. We've talked about a lot of different things this semester. Um, today we're just going to try to uh, apply some of our thoughts and developments uh, relating to um, specifically popular demo democratic theories versus elite democratic theories. And we're going to try to think about them in relation to foreign policy. But I want to say sort of in advance that it's actually not that straightforward to apply that dichotomy to foreign policy thinking because in some ways um, it's more nuanced than that. There's there's at least three theories we want to look at today and possibly four. Um, and uh, you'll see that some of them are way more on the elite democratic spectrum and they're easy to understand. Some of them are on the more popular democratic spectrum, but actually those tend to break into two. And, um, and so we, as we especially sort of try to think about the more liberal style theories um, or the theories that sound more liberal, we had to do a little bit of uh, fancy footwork to understand the nuances between them um, because not all of them are, uh, as you might think, um, you know, peaceful uh, or peace-like, peace-loving. Um, so uh, certainly we have um, uh, uh, some language developed from the previous classes which will help us um, think these through and where necessary I'll be able to add in hopefully some helpful nuances that we can use to to carry us further on our way. So without any further ado let's talk about the democratic debate and foreign policy. Um, elite Democrats as you know we've talked about them before as federalists uh, they tend to uh, have historically disagreed with the anti-federalists um, who have been more um, sort of focused on uh, states' rights sometimes, but also um, getting a voice for the people in the processes of American government, whereas the Federalists have always been of a view that those who are the elites um, have the education and the experience to govern, and the masses uh, often don't, so they should not be given full access to the apparatus of power. And this creates a huge tension, of course, because we know that the um, more elite a society is, the less democratic it is. Okay, so the the question I think that the sort of posed by this tension or this debate has always been to what extent the people uh, should be able to govern themselves, um, because if of course if you take a if you take a, a strong view on this and go for a fully elite uh, society then, uh, you know, the people don't get much of a say at all and you end up with a severe crisis of legitimacy. Um, and many people would say that, uh, for example, um, foreign policy has been beset in American history by a crisis of legitimacy, especially, for example, thinking about the 70s and 60s with the context of the Vietnam War, how many Americans took to the streets to protest that, um, the lack of popularity of the war, um, you know, obviously is a still sort of a theme in American foreign policy, you know, the so-called Vietnam syndrome. So, um, obviously when the elites go too far and govern in, in secrecy, as was thought to be the case during the Vietnam War, um, the people, when they find out what's going on, what's being done in their name, what's being done with their tax dollars, can become quite uh, rebellious and restive. Um, uh, in the face of, of what they see as a lack of democratic um, decision-making, a lack of accountability. And again, they don't like certain things being done in their name. Um, they don't want the world to see um, America acting undemocratically, um, especially when the American people haven't been given a say in how things are being done. So um, one of the great historic figures that uh, have sort of uh, advocated the elite democratic perspective have been Alexander Hamilton, um, who's pictured here. Um, he is sometimes described as a mercantilist or an economic nationalist, which might be a better way to put it. Mercantilists believing that really the nation exists to further the prosperity um, of the nation's businesses, that the nation's businesses and industries are key to a peaceful and prosperous domestic life. And um, and so it is imperative then that America be the number one economy in the world. Um, so Hamilton um, was someone who looked at the world around him and he saw how much 
that Britain had benefited from having an empire, from having a, a, a world order that um, was sort of uh, subservient to it. Britain ruled the high seas. And he basically thought, well, the US should get in on some of that action. And so he advocated that the United States replace Britain in the task of leading and governing the world order, which is very interesting. Um, so so we, economic nationalism or mercantilism, as it's sometimes called, um, emblemized, uh, emblematized by uh, Alexander Hamilton's views, um, was very much uh, of the perspective that American foreign policy exists uh, primarily to further the interests of America's businesses um, with a view that the, the better those businesses are doing, the more wealth is being generated back home and the better people off home will be. So, you know, a more contemporary version of this statement, as your book argues, is the idea that, you know, what's good for General Motors is good for the USA, you know. So um, the US government has to um, support uh, the, these, these businesses and their interests overseas. And so for this reason, Hamilton favored uh, strong executive control, strong uh, presence of uh, strong powers for the presidency um, in relation to foreign policy. And he also thought the America, uh, the United States should have a large army, which was not something that all the presidents at the time agreed with. Uh, George Washington, for example, who's our strong example of a, of a, of a democratic or a popular democratic president, believed rather like Immanuel Kant, the European philosopher who was around in the 18th century, um, um, basically sort of putting forward the idea that um, um, that, that, that when uh, a government has a large army and the people don't get a say over what happens with that army, that the policy makers um, are immune to the costs of their actions, okay? Um, you know, large armies, countries with large armies will will tend to lie to the people about what's going on. Um, they will tend to become uh, hijacked, if you will, by the interests of the large army um, in terms of funneling taxpayers' dollars to providing guns and munitions to the army spending a lot of money on research and technology development for that army um, and engaging in wars of choice uh, as opposed to wars of necessity. Democratically controlled countries where the military is under civilian control um, tend to only engage in wars of necessity. That is to say, they only go to war when they have to. And George Washington uh, famously said, um, you know, in, in his parting address that uh, we should be very much uh, afraid of uh, a, a United States that should ever have a large standing army in time of peace. As he says in a famous quote, although a large standing army in time of peace hath ever been considered dangerous to the liberties of a country, yet few troops under certain circumstances are not only safe, but indispensably necessary. So a few troops keeps you safe, definitely necessary. Um, and a large standing army, he's saying there, is dangerous to the liberties of the country. Sorry, we have a child here in the background. Um, so fortunately for us, our relative situation requires but few. He's saying that America only needs few, and why would that be? Uh, the same circumstances which so effectually retarded, he says, and in the end consider, conspired to defeat the attempts of Britain to subdue us will now powerfully tend to render us secure. Britain had a hard time subduing America. Why? Because of the great distance. He says, our great distance from the European states in a great, uh, and in, in a great degree frees us from apprehension uh, from their numerous regular forces and the insults and dangers which are to be dreaded from their ambition. So the seas, the oceans protected um, America um, and stopped Britain from ever fully colonizing America. Um, and so too now in its independence, America doesn't really need a large army because it has a great distance. But of course, technologically, that was once upon a time. We all now know that uh, these um, oceans um, are a little bit less navigable than they were before. Although admittedly, the homeland, so to speak, has never really been threatened with invasion. Um, not once in its history has America really, uh, since independence, been threatened by a serious uh, effort, um, plan to 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 retake it to to conquer it. 
um, it is fairly safe from um, foreign invasion. And I think the oceans, the material reality of the oceans still has a great deal to do with that. So that's America at the time of its founding and an insight into what at the time seemed to be a very simple debate between, on the one hand, those who wanted to be isolationist and who believed the people should have control, the taxpayers, if you will, should have control. Where taxpayers have control, obviously you're not going to engage in wars of choice. You're only going to engage in necessity. And because America doesn't have any enemies that are really going to threaten it, it can just hang back, okay? Um, uh, whereas Alexander Hamilton saying, no, get out there. You want to be uh, colonizing new lands. You want to be observing how Britain succeeded as a great power and not so much interested in democracy, but more interested in securing a prosperous future for America, even if at the expense of, of democratic life at home. Alexander Hamilton versus Washington um, being sort of two ca cases in point. Now, as time goes by, you have pressures emerging, right? The, obviously, the isolationist pressure um, is an interesting one because it's the case that, yes, Washingtonians, Jeffersonians, the Democrats, in other words, they won um, in the early founding. This, For this reason, isolationism and not great power politics was the core principle of American foreign and defense policy. So the logic of great power politics, of course, being kind of oriented outwards, isolationism being or oriented inwards. And um, apart from uh, some commercial operations overseas, the United States sought to pretty much stay isolated from the world and uh, autonomous from the world. Um, and the two oceans we've mentioned, of course, protected by them, the young republic was able to concentrate on its internal development. And because military threats, in fact, indeed were remote, the standing army stayed small. There wasn't really a large professional army in the United States. It was only when the United States occasionally would become in a war that the military would swell in size. But once that war was over, the citizen soldiers who composed the bulk of the forces would be rapidly demobilized. However, um, we need to think carefully about what we're saying here, right? So what does it mean for America to be isolationist, right? To be looking inwards, um, Americans today look at the size of their country and they think those borders are America, right? And then once you go outside those borders, that's the outside world. But back in uh, the day, there was a much different relationship to that territory, the, the, the homeland territory, okay, was not fully colonized, was not fully expanded into. A lot of it was, from the perspective of American planners, empty space. And um, so the existence of a continent, a continental scale that America could expand into, um, both in Latin America, but also in, indeed in certain places, America saw uh, places like Hawaii and even perhaps in Asia as sort of potential spaces that America could sort of naturally fit into. So um, these were not necessarily thought of as, um, as imperial expansions, but they were thought of almost more from a liberal perspective as uh, places into which America could expand its way of life and its idealistic vision for democracy and capitalism. And so for this reason, we can say that actually it's American liberalism as opposed to the, the, um, the mercantilist views of Hamilton that starts to reveal, if you will, the dark side of, of American foreign policy. Um, and we, if we think about it, um, historically, expansion internally, um, you know, not having been thought of as an overseas kind of expansion, but an internal expansion, but nevertheless showing in some ways, um, not only how America wanted to push the European powers out of the realm, right, out of the hemisphere, get rid of the Spanish, get rid of the French and English, um, in the name of freedom, of course, but, but who got to claim to be a citizen of that project of freedom? Um, clearly, Native Americans didn't, right? They were, they were driven... Uh, by Andrew Jackson, for example, brutally from their homelands, um, all in the name of this American liberal project, okay, this idea of freedom and democracy um, from sea to shining sea. Um, you know, Andrew Jackson notoriously uh, ordered um, blankets infested with chronic diseases to be distributed to 
uh, to, to Native American tribes on the so-called Trail of Tears and uh, led to, you know, borderline genocidal uh, policies um, by the U.S. military at that time. So um, what I'm trying to argue to you here is that um, American expansion had a dark side and that the blame for this dark side belonged to both the elite Democrats and the popular Democrats. And if I haven't made that argument clear, let me just put it this way. Andrew Jackson isn't generally seen as an elite Democrat historically. He's seen as a popular Democrat. This is the same guy, we've spoken about him before, uh, who argued, you know, to the victor go the spoils. And he was the one that broke the back of the American elite Democratic grip on the apparatus of government um, in his time in office. And many people sort of turned to him as a populist Democrat, if anything else, right? So um, he was someone in the same breath, though, who um, used a language that was infused with patriotic culture. Okay, he advocated an honor culture. Um, he he sounded on the surface kind of isolationist. Don't tread on me, he said. Uh, but um, in the same breath, he believed America had a purpose, a strong sense of a destiny. He was a, very much a believer in the American exception. And so he believed in expanding the, the domain and the realm of American democracy as much as he possibly could. Um, so we got to keep that in mind, that curious kind of puzzle that opens up for us there. You know, it's not elites versus popular Democrats. That's just a little too narrow. Within the popular Democratic perspective, we see true isolationists who have this Kantian kind of the people should be the pressure break on uh, the expansion of the military system, thereby guaranteeing democracy. But then a, a sort of another popular democratic perspective, which we can call Jacksonian, and I will use that term in this lecture, the Jacksonian popular democratic perspective saying, no, um, this American democratic project, we got to expand it, we got to uh, you know, bring it to the world, not so much out of a sense of an overtly materialistic or lusty imperial project, but a kind of a different kind of imperial project in some ways, the ideological imperial project. And, um, and, and of course, these two things um, are, are going hand in hand in some ways, the elite democratic tendency towards overt imperialism and the Jacksonian democratic perspective of an idealistic imperialism almost. Um, you can see how those two things would, would work hand in hand, okay? Um, and we'll talk about this in some more detail in just a few slides. Right now, let's just talk about the Cold War. And here, um, let me just talk about the photos briefly. The inset, we have Henry Kissinger, who was one of the leading foreign policy analysts and scholars of the Cold War, um, especially in the late 60s and 70s, a realist. And I'll talk to you more about realism in a minute. And then we have um, Peter Sellers dressed up as Dr. Strangelove. And if you've never seen Dr. Strangelove, then uh, you should know that this is a, um, a film that was sort of set up um, to mock some of the ideology and thinking about the Cold War and uh, specifically the national security state. Uh, and, and let me just talk to you a little bit about that now. So the, the Cold War, as you may know, um, was a tension that existed um, between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, after World War II, it built up um, and had different phases. But um, in that context, it's the first time we can really see the United States emerge on the global scene as a, as a major world power that has an active and interventionist uh, um, sort of uh, policy perspective, right? And so uh, huge governmental shifts took place in the time of uh, American um, uh, policymaking. Um, it developed an enormous military establishment. Um, the Pentagon was established, which was the largest historic um, uh, reorientation of American um, government in its history. And so um, this is a time of a very new role then for American policymakers. They needed a new language, they needed a new way of thinking about the world that, that sort of uh, broke with this sort of isolationism, isolationism of the past um, and uh, that needed to sort of think about how you um, survive in a world where, for example, the Soviet Union is coming along with a huge arsenal of nuclear weapons and America has a huge arsenal of nuclear weapons, um, new concepts are, are required. And, um, and, and the, the theory of realism uh, 
um, was largely the theory that was turned to here. Realism being kind of, if, if I boil it down to a, a nutshell, I would say that realism was a, a willingness to separate your um, moral sentiments, which you, you know, obviously as a democratic country and a liberal country, you are happy at home to have, you know, uh, rights for your citizens, you know, freedom of assembly, freedom uh, to go and start your own religion, and practice your own faith, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, uh, peaceful assembly, all these sort of uh, rights, right to due process, that can all be part of your domestic life. But if that domestic life is threatened by um, huge enemies coming to you from overseas, then uh, you need to sort of divorce your willingness to be a liberal at home from your willingness to be kind of pragmatic um, overseas and in your relationships with others overseas. So um, um, when it came to foreign policy in this instance, really we see a sh shift in power away from um, the other institutions of American government traditionally associated with foreign policy making towards the office of the presidency, right? To sort of, sort of limit and narrow the potential for debate and discussion because circumstances seem to require it. So the president became the overwhelmingly dominant personality in policymaking and came to possess, among other resources, the, the capacity to operate in secret, um, the capacity to sort of um, not have to, the capacity to be able to operate without sort of being subservient to uh, scrutiny from um, the Congress, for example. Um, this is the time that the CIA is developed and the CIA is capable of covert action, kind of 007 stuff overseas and um, has a black budget um, that, that, that is not um, subject to congressional scrutiny. Um, Congress then and the American public are reduced to a marginal role, um, expected to support and not question American actions abroad. And between these factors, these developments give rise to what we call the national security state, right? Which is a complex of uh, presidential or executive powers combined with military and secret powers that previously American Republic had never seen. And these are all, of course, going to be consistent with a kind of elite democratic perspective, okay? And you can see why, because the people are not really getting much of a perspective on what's going on here. And the thing is, though, like these things. Um, Washington's warning, you know, Washington warned about the permanent army and, and secrecy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the military. And, and what we're seeing here, I think, is that it's true to an extent, because after the Cold War ends, the national security state lingers and um, sort of starts searching for a new purpose. Um, that, that uh, you know, is, is, is something that I think lingers even today, this tendency, you know, Clinton argued for a peace dividend and that they should all be sort of like demobilized after the Cold War because after all America had won and there's no need to be so um, so so uh, armed because you, you know the, the defense of the homeland doesn't require all this military right so um, as we learn later from Chalmers Johnson in this lecture you know the um, truth of the matter is that that America has way 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 more military than it needs to defend itself it, it has enough military that the only possible conclusion can be that it's designed for overseas interventions and actions. Um, and, and I'll leave it to you to figure out for yourself whether you think that that is a defensive, preemptively defensive operation or something a bit more aggressive. You know, is it necessity or choice that's motivating that? We'll come back to that question in a little while. But back to the Cold War briefly, um, one of the things that America was able to do um, with um, uh, 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 this sort of reorientation um, of, of its posture um, was to start being an active broker of great power politics, uh, specifically in Europe, um, where it organized and brokered a, uh, a European alliance, which we know as NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And the goal there was very important for America to block Soviet expansion in Europe um, now, the French and the British, of course, didn't like that um, because for America to succeed in its goals uh, in hemming in the Soviet Union, it couldn't have all its forces locked down in Europe um, as it was after World War II. It had to be able to re-pivot those forces to, say, fight the Korean War, for example, or Vietnam War. So to have Europe organizing its own defense presupposed a 
armed Germany, that was something very, very difficult for Britain and France to swallow. So there had to be a quid pro quo there. And eventually what we see coming out of that is a Europe, and I won't get into too much detail here, but this is really what we're talking about, the origins of the European Union, actually. Because um, as the US is going to draw down its troops in Europe to distribute them elsewhere and hem in the Soviet Union, um, Germany is going to be rearmed and the French and the Brits are going to look for a quid pro quo, that is for German power to be tied into an alliance called NATO, but also I think vis-a-vis -vis common goods and services in Europe, which we know today are the single market of the European Union. Um, um, you know, the, the French and the British were going to want to see um, German coal and steel. These are the raw materials of, of building an army, of course, right? So these things were going to be um, uh, subjected to um, a kind of a, a, a bargain or a deal uh, which, which led to the emergence of the European Union. And, and so many Americans look at the European Union today, they don't fully understand what it is or what its origins were, but um, it's interesting to talk about because, and it's very tangential to this lecture, but it's interesting to talk about because in some ways it's the origins of European peace. We've had 50, 60 plus years of, of European peace. And the question is, how has that been possible? Um, many would argue that it's because um, the Europeans were restructured in terms of their relationships with each other from being independent countries to being countries that were locked into this trading alliance, um, this, this commercial um, structure called the European Union, which had power over and above them um, and it was the only way the French would agree to seeing Germany rearmed. Um, so again, um, ideologically, one of the things that becomes very clear here, whether it's the national security state or talking about NATO, America didn't think that it um, was being an empire or being expansionist. Instead, what it saw was kind of like the, the, the superpower that had been sort of um, 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 without its intentions being sort of forced into um, um, kind of a, a, a responsibility in the world to protect the world from communism, right? So it's it's not so much seen as an empire of choice. Um, this expansion, this huge expansion of American power on a global basis was seen as a kind of a expansion of necessity to prevent the Soviet Union uh, from expanding and to stop the spread of communism. Um, this is a uniquely American uh, perspective, though, because many other countries um, did, um, you know, even Italy, France, right after World War II, borderline communist uh, elections, um, you, you know, so these were modern Western countries. Um, many people had seen World War II not so much as a battle between democracy and fascism, but communism and fascism, and uh, the will of the people being a communist will, so to speak. Um, America was hugely uh, um, concerned with the, the global spread of communism, and indeed it was a global ideology. Uh, the question is, was it the Soviet Union sort of driving it, or was it something more spontaneous from the bottom up? Um, we could talk in much more detail here about the Vietnam War, for example, uh, which America, I think today its historians are pretty, um, pretty, pretty convinced that that was a misunderstood war. Um, America, under, America misunderstood that war, um, seeing it as kind of a, a, a necessary to, to build a, a check against Soviet aggression. But for the local people, it was very much a struggle for, um, um, you know, post-colonial autonomy and independence. Anyway, uh, some digressions there. I apologize. <clears throat> now let's talk about foreign policy since the Cold War. Um, the lecture takes a little turn here. I want to just talk to you a little bit about Francis Fukuyama. Um, and it's not really part of your textbook's uh, argument, but I think it's really important to, to talk about Francis Fukuyama. So the Cold War, as you know, ended um, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December of 1991. And after the Cold War, um, foreign policy, I think, lost its salience for many Americans. Um, you can sort of see that in... Um, movies that were made in the post-Cold War environment, like Independence Day, for example, famously sort of a post-Cold War movie showing a sort of global community of people living together and 
not really having to worry too much about um, um, you know the, the, the overseas entanglements. Uh, so you know what what was the ideology? What was the way of thinking? You know, fascinatingly, many Americans believe that what had happened with the passing of the Soviet Union was a kind of an ideological victory of of America's way of life. Okay, the American culture, so to speak, uh, based on enlightenment values of of democracy and free markets um, seem to have sort of become the global choice, right? The people of the world had voted and uh, communism had been deemed to be bankrupt and um, uh, democratic elections seemed to be going on all around the world in the 80s and 90s, late, late 80s, early 90s. Um, the communist Eastern Bloc had, had, had adopted what looked like an American uh, mode of government. So um, this is the context then within which Francis Fukuyama um, uh, comes on the scene. He is George Bush Sr.'s uh, foreign policy advisor. He's a conservative philosopher. And he argues um, that basically what we're living in is something like the end of human history, um, the end of social history or the end of political history, because all the battles are over, right? Communism is gone. Um, where's the challenge going to come that's going to knock capitalism democracy? So he's like, maybe we should ask if we're at a point now where we, as he says here in the quote, cannot imagine a world substantially different from our own, in which there is no apparent or obvious way in which the future will represent a fundamental improvement over our current order. He says, if that's true, then we must also take into consideration the possibility that history itself might be at an end. And notice his use of capital H history here. If you're a philosopher yourself, you might uh, know a little bit about Hegel. And uh, Hegel used um, the word history in a very similar way. That there's a kind of a spirit of history, or, or if you will, uh, that, that politics has a spirit of history built into it that's working its way to express itself in human interactions. And, um, and that that's uh, in Fukuyama's time, you know, kind of become the um, the 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 the, um, the conclusion that uh, history has a spirit. And anyway, um, so all of this is to say that there's a kind of a ideological triumphalism um, at the end of the uh, at the end of the Cold War, and um, and 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 that this is kind of a new turn in, in foreign policy making. So you see. Uh, George Bush Sr., you see Bill Clinton, um, you know, going to Somalia, going to places like this, um, in the name of what George Bush Sr. called a new world order, okay, this is the new world that's, that's existing, um, that um, the United States military is now going to be oriented towards protecting not just America's interests, but, you know, um, standing up to China vis-a-vis -vis human rights atrocities in Tibet, that kind of thing, and, and America is now becoming the world's policeman, um, okay, so if that's the case post 9-11, um, the next chapter of our story requires us to speak about 9-11, which many people say um, marked a, a return of history. So let's talk about that now. So 9-11, if, um, if the end of the Cold War appeared to some people to represent the end of history, the end of human or political history, um, then 9-11 seemed to put uh, the end of history as an idea, or our foreign policy perspective, on trial. Okay, And we noticed the resurgence of a theory that was actually created in and around the same time as Fukuyama's, um, but this one is called The Clash of Civilizations by Samuel Huntington. And it stayed dormant, if you will, for a little while, uh, but it definitely became popular after 9-11, wherein um, uh, Huntington says that, you know, don't think that the end of the Cold War will be peaceful, um, because underneath the sort of um, um, uh, uh, wallpaper of uh, the, um, the the end of the Cold War, um, underneath the surface level tension of the clash between the Soviet Union, the ideological clash between the Soviet Union and, and the United States vis-a-vis -vis communism and democracy, there are actually much deeper human uh, passions 
um, that uh, uh, you know might not have been so obvious during the Cold War, but but bubbling away underneath, surely, he says there are civilizational conflicts, and he says that the future wars will result from cultural dynamics, not from these ideological dynamics, and 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 what's he talking about, right? Um, he's using in a way a metaphor borrowed from geology um, concerning. Uh, plate tectonics, and if you know what plate tectonics are, they're speaking to this idea that the planet has plates, tectonic plates, that move over millennia very, very slowly, but sometimes very suddenly, creating volcanoes, earthquakes, you name it, creating mountain ranges, um, or creating rifts. And uh, he identifies eight cultural plates, um, uh, cultural paradigms or civilizations, he calls them, the Western, the Confucian, the Japanese, the Islamic, the Hindu, the Slavic, Orthodox, Latin American, and African. And, well, I'll be honest with you, he's had, he got huge criticism for some of these theories, right? Because um, it's not clear why, um, why he, for example, gave Japan its own civilization, right? Why is Latin American different to European or Western? Uh, what is African civilization when clearly there's lots of different civilizations in Africa? Um, you know, so um, he uh, may have been um, overly restrictive in, uh, and, and maybe even a bit imaginative in positing these fault lines. Um, but also perhaps a little unhistorical, right? Because um, why could he explain why were sometimes these civilizations um, enjoying relations of peace with each other and other times enjoying relation not enjoying relations of peace but in fact having relations of enmity um it's it's, it's a clumsy theory in some ways right it's it's not a very historical theory it's not sensitive to historical nuances and variations um and um one person that really challenged uh, Samuel Huntington's argument in a very strong way was Benjamin Barber, who wrote a book called Jihad versus Macworld. And I wanted to mention that to you because it seemed to me, at least, that that Barber um, was was making a really interesting point that that while there may have been civilizational tendencies potentially at work on the planet, these were not um, becoming violent or tense in relation to each other but rather something else that's going on at a meta level above and beyond the level of these civilizations, which we call globalization, the globalization of commercialism, uh, consumerism, uh, industrialism, uh, capitalism, um, uh, bringing um, information technology and communications um, networks uh, to a global basis, um, putting cultures in proximity to each other, um, but also putting into proximity with these cultures um, a new types of cultural behavior which were specifically previously only limited to the Western world. And I think this is where Huntington gets it wrong. Individualism is not uniquely Western phenomena because in fact Western world has its own um, reaction against this as well. So why I think Barber is relevant is because he's using the two words here, very useful words in my view, jihad versus macworld. As you can see here, that's the title of his book. And I recommend this book to you, actually. I think it's a marvelous book in some ways. Still very relevant, even though it's over 10, 15 years old now, I think. But um, one thing very important here is to specify what he means by the word jihad. He, his usage of this term is fascinating. For those of you who follow the news, you know that sometimes jihadi is sometimes a term that's used to describe Islamic extremism or Islamic fundamentalism uh, or, or Islamic militancy. But um, Barber is using the word differently. He's saying that jihad really is any reaction on the part of any religious or cultural grouping against globalization. So, you know, there can be Hindu jihadism, there can be Christian jihadism, there can be Islamic jihadism, uh, you name it, right? Any religion um, can react against consumeristic individualism. Consumer individualism consumeristic individualism is represented by Macworld. Okay, Macworld is the... Is the um, the, 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 the globalized sort of consumer economy 
where McDonald's li exi exists literally everywhere in the world. And it's not just McDonald's fault at all, of course, but you know, that's Mac world is the, the world of sameness and ubiquity that spreads through global capitalism. And it gives us all Marlboro cigarettes, McDonald's, blue jeans, you know, etc., etc. You know, Victoria's Secrets on a global basis, God help us all. And, uh, and uh, you know, Britney Spears, number one hit, um, you know, Japan, Australia, South Africa, Canada, right? It's the end of global culture, okay? It's the, the globalization of consumerism. And it's very much about me, 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 you know, my tastes, my uh, relationships, uh, my needs. And I don't uh, think uh, as much as I used to culturally about my community, right? Uh, the, 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 the values of morality and ethics of my community that keep us bound to each other in relationship to each other. So individualism is about fragmentation. Community and religion bring us back to our sense of place and a proximity to each other where we don't put our, ourselves and our desires first, we put our community first. Um, and so for Barber, Jihad versus Macworld is the real tension that's going on today. And what 9-11 what was about, I think, from Barber's perspective, I think, would be much more to do with a reaction against, you know, it was, the, it was the World Trade Center, after all, that was hit. It was the Pentagon, after all, that was hit. These were symbols, not just of American power, but of American policeman um, functionality vis-a-vis um, -vis globalization. Uh, safeguarding globalization and um, and this was of course uh, a, a, a different way of interpreting the target right not just an American target but a target uh, very much affiliated with the functions of globalization so that said post 9-11 um, Huntington seemed to to win the debate now on this slide we make some interesting points um, want to talk about um, we've mentioned realism already with Henry Kissinger. Um, there's a strong myth of political realism in U.S. foreign policy, of course. Um, in reality, um, American foreign policy um, has always been sort of um, draped in the clothing of uh, idealism. I've mentioned this to you already before with Andrew Jackson. And um, realistically, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's never gone away. Um, and it, it's, I suppose it's what we're positing or posing in this slide is the question, you know, why is it that the U.S. has not been able to stay isolationist despite the fact that so many of its founding fathers were isolationists? Why is it that it has to go off around the world interfering in other people's affairs? Um, is it because of liberalism? Um, po possibly it is, yeah. And, and we've drawn the distinction between the Jeffersonian and Washingtonian ideal on the one hand um, which, uh, you know, is about people controlling the military and the Jacksonian populist ideals, whereby the people, even though they're truly controlling the military, get on board with the idea of an exceptionalist U.S. mission or purpose in the world, right? A, a, a raison d'etre, um, you know, the, the, the British had this as well, right? The French had this as well. The idea that somehow it was their destiny to bring civilization to the planet, right? Um, making the mistake that so many great powers make, of course, thinking and assuming that because they are the preeminent power, that their views and ideals naturally are the optimal views and ideals of the whole planet and that everyone would embrace them if they were truly free. Um, of course, life's not so simple. Um, so there is this liberal sort of impulse, this Jacksonian impulse in American foreign policy that defies elite democratic thinking, which is raw imperialism, of course, you know, and, and no one really goes down for that, that Hamiltonian imperialism is not very popular in America, right? We must do it for our, you know, we're just going to do it to put oil in our pockets. Um, that, 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 that kind of overt imperialistic ethic doesn't seem to go down that well in America. But neither is American isolationist country. In fact, it's a Jacksonian populist country if you follow the logic of the theory so far. And there's two major criticisms that can be brought to bear um, on why that's so. And the, the slide contains the cover of the book, um, The Israel Lobby uh, by Mearsheimer and Walt. They are realists and they believe that one of the reasons that America sometimes engages in wars overseas out of choice and not necessity, 
is because of mistaken beliefs, mistaken thinking. And in the particular case of um, Israel and uh, the, the, you know, repeated Israeli um, assaults on, uh, you know, the, the people of the Palestinian territories, um, one of the points that Mirsheimer and Walt make, taking the long view, which is that, you know, American support for Israel ultimately it being counterproductive uh, because it's bad publicity in the Muslim world. It, the more America uh, pursues this ideology of defending Israel, um, they argue, um, the more that it uh, sort of acts as a recruitment um, uh, beacon for anyone in the Muslim world who wants to take up arms. So it just it's fuel on the fire for anti-American sentiment. And while defending Israel might have had a utility during the Cold War as a bulwark against Soviet expansion in the Middle East, there's no real way that defending Israel today defends America's actual material interests, right? It's rather this side of Jacksonian expansionist mindset of bringing American culture and beliefs to the world and Israel being seen as sort of like a, a brotherly ally in that purpose. Um, but it's tremendously expensive for America to do that. And also it's very um, bad for Israel to think that it can do whatever it wants and still expect American support. This is the argument that Mirsheimer and Walter are making, that actually in the long run it would be better for Israel if America pulled back on its support. Um, first of all, it would save Americans a lot of money and grief from potential Islamic extremism down the road. Second of all, it would give Israel a much more accurate perspective that the, the actions that it carries out, the, the hostility that it perpetrates on um, Palestinians, who after all don't have a remotely sophisticated military compared to Israel, which has one of the most sophisticated militaries in the world, um, you know that it would that it it would it would give Israel a, a much more accurate sense of the costs of its actions. Um, and uh, and so Mearsheimer and Walt argue that because of this Jacksonian mindset in America, it leaves it very vulnerable and weak to lobbying from uh, countries like Israel um, that put a disproportionate spin on American foreign policy, even against its own interests. So um, we can summarize that with the idea of the tail wagging the dog, right? Everyone thinks the dog wags the tail, right? Because the dog has the brain, the tail is the muscle and the limb. But actually, uh, metaphorically speaking, the tail wagging the dog means that even against the interests of the dog, the tail is kind of calling the shots. Um, Mearsheimer and Walt as conservative foreign policy uh, theorists and analysts argue that that's inappropriate for America. Now, over on the other side, you, you have critical scholars who say that that's kind of silly, right? The, the, the idea of a tail wagging a dog you know, America is a huge power, a very advanced military apparatus, perfectly capable of acting on its own interests. Therefore, if America is supporting Israel, it's not because the tail's wagging the dog, it's because the dog is wagging the tail. And while support for Israel may be inappropriate, it's still the case that, um, um, you know, there's something going on here that's, that's, that's sort of rationally beneficial to America's sort of imperial mindset. Um, well, I'll leave it to you guys to decide where you stand on that, but those are two perspectives on the um, sort of ubiquity of a moral instinct in, in, in US foreign policy and explaining again why America is, is not a, a very idealist um, power um, or isolationist power, but rather in fact an expansionist power. Taking a, a further uh, analysis now of Jacksonian sentiment, um, you know, at, at, at home we know that America uh, overwhelmingly supported uh, the war in Iraq. Um, could Jacksonian sentiment have explained that? Um, well, the, the Jacksonian interpretation of 9-11 very much fits with, I think, the ideals that we've outlined with the clash of civilizations of Samuel Huntington. Um, the, the idea of a clash of good and evil, a moral purpose versus an immoral purpose, civilized world versus the irrational outlaws, and also perhaps notions also of honor, retribution, crusade, supporting the troops, standing by our president, right or wrong, you know, um, these are all very sort of classically Jacksonian themes. Um, in the slide here, we have the lyrics of a song from Daryl Worley, uh, 
and he sang for the Pentagon personnel uh, at a concert a week after the fall of Baghdad in 2003. And he said it was a, a pro-America song. Um, and just look at what the, the song sort of contains. You know, if, if it's a pro-American song, what, what are the values of America that are expressed in, this, in, this, in the lyrics? Um, I hear people saying that we don't need this war. I say there's some things that are worth fighting for. What about our freedom and this piece of ground? Didn't we, we didn't get to keep them by backing down, right? Sometimes you gotta fight. Mm. They say we don't realize the mess we're getting in. Um, hmm, well, here we are, what, over 10 years later. Um, uh, they say you don't realize the mess you're getting in, but before you start preaching, let me ask you this, my friend. Have you forgotten how it felt that day to see your homeland under fire? and her people blown away. Um, so, you know, very strong patriotic themes there that are showing that there's a purpose um, in, in American uh, overseas action that is to do with a sort of a, a core moral belief, a, a faith in the more moral integrity of the country. Um, um, and and um, th this is what, what ultimately people refer to as exceptionalism. Right, the idea that America is not just any old country; it's a different country. It's a, it's a, what Ronald Reagan called a shining city on a hill. Um, it's a beacon that people around the world look to, um, to be that one place that will stand and fight for democracy. You know, it saved the day in World War Two, and uh, saved the day in World War One, and uh, you know, it's it's the country of last r resort, the the ultimate refuge for democracy and downtrodden masses all over the world turn and look to America for inspiration in the night, in the dark of the night um, uh, of political persecution. They'll they'll see America as a shining beacon of hope. And this is, of course, sentiment of George Bush's speech when he lands on the USA Blinken in on an aircraft carrier and declares mission accomplished. You know, this is... Sorry about that interruption there. So, um... Now let's talk about sort of looking at Iraq. I mean, I think it's very important if we're talking about foreign policy and the ideologies of foreign policy, we also have to talk about, you know, some of the results and evaluate some of this. You know, um, Daryl Worley, you know, obviously with his Jacksonian um, message for the Pentagon personnel, looking back on it now, it seems that around 2003, 2005, 2006, Oh, there was a very strong sort of rallying around the flag. And that makes sense to a certain extent because, of course, any nation that's being attacked, um, you know, is going to to want to stand together, to come together, to find a certain unity. Um, but unity at any expense, I think that's a really important question, right? So evaluating Iraq today, um, it seems there's a lot that can be said, right? I mean, a lot of people, who, even people who supported it initially, have now kind of looked at the situation and go like, well, clearly we didn't know what we were getting into, okay? This was, this was completely not thought through. Um, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11 after all. That was something Donald Rumsfeld wanted to uh, argue for, but, you know, it was inappropriate perhaps that, that to make that argument because... Um, you, you, you know, there, were, there was no material evidence that Saddam Hussein had anything to do with 9-11. Um, in fact, if anything, he probably would not have liked the guys that carried out 9-11 because he was kind of like a secular dictator, not an Islamist. Um, that's an important point to keep in mind um, when you start to think about, you know, potential alliances between Iraq and Al-Qaeda, right? In fact, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that uh, neoconservative foreign policy plan planners um, prior to George Bush Jr. coming to office had long already been arguing to Bill Clinton that Iraq was a foreign policy priority for America, not to do with anything because of Al-Qaeda, but because uh, an emergent China or an emergent India might be able to ally with Iraq in order to extract oil at a decent price. And they believed that in order for America to stay the number one power on the planet, this is uh, published in their documents, Plan for a New American Century, uh, which is just before 9-11. Um, uh, uh, um, they said that really we'd have to go back to Iraq and finish the job um, that was started um, back, um, you know, by George Bush Sr., and, uh, and finish the job and make sure that no one could ever really 
um, uh, you know, balance with Iraq to 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 um, I, to, to tilt the scales of of power away from America. Um, these guys, of course, were the guys that these neoconservatives were the guys that were in power when um, when 9/11 happened. They were the advisors of George Bush when 9/11 happened, and um, it's clear they had a very strong uh, influence on George Bush's foreign policy perspective, right? Because all of a sudden, you know, guys from Afghanistan hit the World Trade Center, but we end up in Iraq, okay? And we're still in Iraq. Um, what was the real motivation, right? Some people say it was about oil. Um, I, I don't really think so. I think indirectly, perhaps. I think much more re reality was that it was an ideological distinction. We, we know, for example, there's limited evidence for this, um, but it's enough for, for genuine suspicion. For example, the Downing Street memo, wherein the British cabinet learned um, that the United States was going to go into Iraq uh, using WMDs merely as a pretext, that, that in fact Bush and Cheney knew there were no WMDs in Iraq, and of course now we know for a fact there were no WMDs in Iraq. There have never been WMDs in Iraq, okay, except the ones that were left over from the Iran-Iraq war, which were provided for by the United States, right? The mustard gas and this kind of stuff that was used in the 80s versus Iran when Iran and Iraq were at war. Um, you know, the, 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 those were largely inert. They would never have been able to harm anyone, really. Um, uh, they were not worth classifying as WMDs. But, you know, when... when um, when uh, Colin Powell uh, stood before the UN and gave this very elaborate slideshow showing, demonstrating um, all this evidence, um, these computer diagrams of, of, of mobile chemical weapons trucks mo roving around the Iraqi desert, um, you know, he was being fed this line by the CIA and, and via the Department of State's, De Department of Defense's intelligence agency. Um, and it all turned out to be just completely bogus afterwards, right? And Colin Powell says to this day that it was the most shameful day of his life, you know, because he basically lied to the world. He didn't realize he was lying, I think, but but he was. And and I think it's reasonable to surmise that people like Dick Cheney had a lot to do with that. Um, uh, you know, so there was the, 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 the neoconservatives were hell-bent on Iraq. They'd been hell-bent on Iraq before 9-11, and they saw 9-11 as an opportunity to go in. Looking back on it now, um, you know, uh, people say that it showed a catastrophically poor understanding of of reality, right? That of what of what the world was going to be like after Saddam Hussein. Dennis Ross, for example, he was the Middle East envoy for George Bush Senior, and for Bill Clinton. And he says basically the reasons for the war were never fully explained to the American people. Um, had the American people really known why they were going into Iraq, they would never have agreed to it. And now we're paying the price because it's become a magnet for terrorists. And I think, frankly, looking at the situation with ISIS today in Syria and in Iraq, I mean, it's obvious that this area is, is not stable. And, um, and this is going to continue to cost the United States money. Um, at a time when the economy has not been doing well. You know, in this class, we've had debates about welfare and people abusing the welfare system. You could add up all the welfare fraud in the country and it wouldn't even come close to a tiny sliver of the amount of money that the war in Iraq has cost. As Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winning economist, has calculated, it's a $3 trillion war based on current projections. That is an unimaginable sum of money. You know, uh, the conservatives, Republicans want to shut down government because they don't like the debt. They don't like the debt ceiling being expanded. Well, guys, you know, where's the debt coming from? Is it coming from um, your next door neighbor, um, you know, uh, an unmarried mother uh, drawing down, um, you know, uh, food stamps? Uh, it's not from that. The debt's got nothing to do with people on welfare. Uh, you know, Amer the American welfare system is already the worst in the world anyway. I mean, compared to and other industrial democracies, there is no welfare system in the United States of America to speak of. I mean, there's no private health care. There's no uh, public health care system to speak of. Um, so, um, you know, t t t it's just a bizarre 
kind of situation where we are still not really properly explained the facts behind the Iraq war or uh, the, the way the war has, uh, you know, uh, continued and the way it continues to cost people money, right? I mean, a lot of that money, by the way, that $3 trillion, something like a third of it or something is going to be just dealing with veterans, um, the costs of the veterans, right, in terms of their mental health care, their 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 physical health care. Um, you know, we don't do a good job of that in this country. There's been a lot of scandals recently in relation to how we treat veterans. And, um, and I think those scandals will continue because the war was not funded appropriately. Um, it, it, truthfully, America would have had to, you know, set up and borrow to fight the war. Um, but at the same time, instead of doing that, we were cutting taxes. Okay, tax cuts is for the rich that are still sort of lingering and Congress renews them every year. Um, other things that I think, uh, you know, beyond the financial cost, I mean, I think there's the PR cost, right? There's There's been a tremendously bad uh, impression of the United States given to people around the world uh, because of this uh, action, which was unilateral, went in with a handful of nations to give it a veil of leg legitimacy, but the major other nations of the world did not stand by the United States in going into Iraq. They were extremely concerned about the potential effects. And so, you know, other leading nations like, like Germany, France, uh, did not go in. Um, and that's hugely problematic, right? Because where those countries were willing to stand with the United States vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan, they thought Iraq was a boondoggle. And it may well prove to be the case now that it's true. Um, the majority of people in the world, according to polls, did not support the United States going into Iraq. And um, in the aftermath of Iraq, something like only a third of the planet's population believed the United States was playing a, a positive role in the world. Um, that's, a, that's a terrible indictment, I think. So we're coming close to the end of the lecture here, and we just have to talk about um, Chalmers Johnson, who's worth mentioning here. He's not in the textbook, but I believe he's worth mentioning because he's just someone who was very, very sharp, um, he passed away recently, but he was very sharp on the, um, the um, you, you know, uh, veteran analyst and thinker and commentator who'd seen both sides of the fence. He'd worked for the Department of State. He'd been a U.S. ambassador in China, I believe, um, uh, or at least working in the U.S. embassy in China, uh, or Japan, excuse me. And um, he was a former uh, CIA analyst himself and a naval officer as well. So he's got a lot of experience. And he, he wrote three books in the context of 9-11, and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about them. Um, the first is the, um, is, is the um, blowback, and uh, blowback is um, a, a book that sort of looks at the long history of US foreign policy, and it's an interesting term because it's a term that people continue to use today. It was originated actually by the CIA in the aftermath of the US assassination of Mossadegh in Iran in the 50s, when they installed the Shah of Iran, who would basically, he was a, he was a non-democratically, where Mossadegh had been elected, he was a socialist. The US didn't like the socialists, so they had to, because they feared an alignment with the Soviet Union. So they put in the king, right, the Shah, who'd been kicked out um, previously. Um, so the Shah that comes to power, an uh, extremely unpopular guy, and of course, by the time 1979 comes around, we have the Iranian Revolution, and when the Ayatollah comes to power, the CIA's prediction has come true, right? But the CIA operative at the time wrote back to the White House and said, um, expect some blowback on this, right, for putting the Shah into power. And Jalmers Johnson explains that the, the, the concept of blowback refers to the unintended consequences of the policies that were kept secret from the American people, right? You keep things secret, it's going to come back and bite you in the ass eventually, right? And um, again, it's this idea that if the American people knew the true purpose of some of the foreign policy decisions that were made overseas. And this is not conspiracy theory stuff. Actually, as you know, I hate conspiracy theories. But it's not a conspiracy if you can show um, the decision makers, if you can show um, the theories and the interests that were leveraged in order to carry out some sort of mission right? It's a conspiracy theory if you're saying it's all happening in secret, that behind the scenes it's really the Jews or it's really the, um, the secret government, right? Um, I, 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 I think those are problematic formulations. But, um, but, you know, 
it's not to say conspiracies don't happen, okay? So um, carrying on from that, Sorrows of Empire, a more recent book, then um, dealing more explicitly with um, the 9-11 environment, looks at how the United States has used 9-11 um, as a pretext to expand a global network of what he calls lily pad bases, military bases in over 100 countries around the world. And he questions this, you know, because he's like, the, the ostensible reasons for these bases, which was the Cold War, is over. Uh, and yet the bases remain and they've been expanded even after 9-11 in order to um, try to, you know, uh, find bases for bombing in Afghanistan, Iraq, etc. Right. So Chalmers Johnson comes up with an interesting def definition of imperialism on this basis. Right. It's the domination and exploitation of weaker states by stronger ones, simply put. Right. And so even if this domination and exploitation is motivated by the Jacksonian culture that we've talked about, it's still imperialism. OK, it doesn't have to be the old British colonial style imperialism to be imperialism. There's other ways of being empire. And, and this is his complaint, um, you know, that that U.S. citizens have not been um, have not had this argument expressed to them. They're still used to thinking of America as an exceptional power that does things for good um, as opposed to does things for uh, ideological purposes that might be incorrect or wrong. Um, are, are unwelcome at the very least, right? So this is this is why the concept of blowback is so important because if no one educates the population on this stuff and the people uh, in the policy-making uh, areas of uh, U.S. government continue to think that they're immune to scrutiny, well, what do you think's going to happen, right? Um, Nemesis was his final book before he passed away. And he wrote that in 2007. And this is, of course, four years after the invasion of Iraq. And it's an evaluation of where we are with the blowback hypothesis, right? He says that U.S. military spending um, exceeds uh, that of all other defense budgets on Earth, right? You could add up everyone else's military budget on Earth and still not have the military budget of the United States. So what's going on, right? Is this George Washington's prophecy come true? that the military, once it becomes permanent in a large, powerful country, starts to develop a power of its own, you know, a self-perpetuating logic that soaks up more and more and more of the taxpayers' dollars, okay? What has been the impact of U.S. militarism um, on American democracy? Chalmers Johnson says there's an irony here that most American citizens are not aware of, which is that America was born as an anti-imperial power. Conversely, today, it may well stand before us as the new Rome. He says, if there was an honest account, the actual size of our military empire would probably top 1,000 different bases overseas. But no one knows the exact number for sure, he says. It's, it's, it's blacked off. It's not discussed in Congress. Congre the congressmen don't even know because it's a secret budget. So he said, the lack of education on this basically has led to what he calls a delusional idealism, right? And he says this shouldn't surprise us in some ways because great powers always seem to think that they are an exception to the rule, that they aren't doing it for selfish reasons. The British told themselves to the very end that their empire wasn't an empire, or at least not a selfish empire. They believed that they were doing something for the civilization. They were on a civilizing mission to bring enlightenment to dark Africa, to the dark continent. And the French also were very similar. And if we go back to the Peloponnesian Wars um, after the Persian invasions in, in Greece and, you know, before the birth of Christ, right, you, you have Pericles, the Athenian leader, giving his funeral oration saying, you know, we didn't ask for this empire. Uh, we didn't ask to be powerful, but we are powerful. We find ourselves in a position of great power. And it would be a great moral shame if we didn't use our power for good. But what's his idea of good and what's everyone else's idea of good? They're different things. The Spartans didn't like the Greek attitude, right? The Spartans believed in military prowess and dignity and, and, and they didn't advocate democracy, right? Whereas the Athenians believed that they were democratic. And so the Spartans are like, you're trying to impose your way of life on us. The Athenians are saying, why wouldn't you want freedom? <laughs> um, well, not everyone wants freedom, okay? You have to give a certain latitude that not everyone wants to live in democracy. Um, or if they want to live in democracy, they might have a different idea of what democracy is than you do. So this is kind of like to each their own kind of idea. But 
but empires have a hard time seeing that. So Chalmers Johnson says, you know, it's not just an ideology at the end of the day, um, but the ideology really helps. Um, sure, um, the U.S. empire, so to speak, um, has benefited a lot. And there is that kind of Hamiltonian aspect that we talked about at the start of the lecture, right? That we've seen United States-based companies like Halliburton, Kellogg, Brown and Root get huge military contracts in Iraq for reconstruction there, running the laundries for the soldiers in, in Iraq, huge amount of money. Um, as you know, Dick Cheney was on the boards of all of these companies, I think. Um, so got like huge, you know, huge questions of ethics, I think, on the table as a result of that, but whatever. They were uh, they were no-bid contracts anyway. They were not put out for tender. They were just contracts that were given to these companies. Um, you know, so that's kind of hugely problematic, I think. Um, and as the truth comes out more and more about these, as the journalists do their work, we find out that, you know, a lot of people did well out of the Iraq war. Um, and the U.S., of course, doesn't always get to pay or have to pay for its global network of bases. You know, um, countries like Japan pay about $4 billion a year in costs towards the so-called burden sharing of having U.S. military bases in Japan. Um, so, you know, America doesn't have to pay for all of it, 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 it and, and American companies do really well out of it. Um, but I think that all said, I reserve personally a... A, a, a strong sense in my mind that that the motivations are more ideological than material. Um, and so I tend to be sympathetic when people say it wasn't about the oil. I think it was a little bit about the oil, but I also think it's more about ideology. I think US empire, if there is an empire, is more about is more about ideology at the end. So look, it wouldn't be a fair lecture if we didn't talk about Obama. Let's wrap it up here with a little conversation about Obama's drone war, and that'll be our last slide. Now, your book argues that Obama's worldview is, in many respects, the opposite of Bush's. Rejecting Bush's unilateralism, Obama favors multilateral, multilateral partnerships. Bush was more go it alone, unilateral, okay? Um, and your book argues this persuasively, but but um, I, 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 I see, I feel like I disagree. To a certain extent. Now, your book is fair on this, I think, you know, that there's continuity between Bush and Obama, and it makes sense because Obama is also a post 9 11 president, and we're living in a post 9 11 world. Um, but what, where, where have been the continuities and even successes of, Obama, of, of Bush's policies as perpetrated by Obama, right? So, um, obviously, we have the killing of Osama bin Laden on May 1st, 2011. Um, the leader of al-Qaeda was taken out, um, interestingly, um, done outside of the law, right? It was an assassination. It was um, U.S. forces went into another sovereign country's got, uh, territory and, and killed someone. Um, that's against international law, right? So why is the U.S. not being taken to court for that? I don't know. Um, you know, what? whatever happened to the principles of... of uh, of, of um, you know, um, justice, that, uh, you know, you're entitled to a trial. Um, one of the things that um, terrorists want to do when they attack you is get you to change your values, right? So if you're a democracy standing up for, for a certain principle of justice and, and procedure, um, in a way, in my mind anyway, the terrorists win a little bit if they get you to reject your basic values, you know? Um, so it's maybe it's great that we got Osama bin Laden, but, you know, wouldn't it have been better to to get him extradited and to um, put him on trial and expose him um, to the world as the fraud that he was? I mean, in a way, by taking him out, aren't you kind of playing into the hands of conspiracy theorists once again? Um, Obama has done a lot of work, though, um, on the intelligence side, um, in fact, perhaps even outdoing his predecessor, um, by taking out members of Al-Qaeda, right? Um, he's used a lot of missile attacks, used a lot of drone attacks, um, these are remote-controlled aircraft, um, and he has also continued the indefinite detention of, of suspected terrorists in places like Guantanamo Bay, 
Um, he has also used uh, official state secrets acts to block judicial review of counterterrorism policies. He's a very secretive president in this regards, just as Bush was. Um, and I think perhaps most controversially for Obama, he's continued domestic surveillance programs. And there's been a lot of these exposed um, with people like uh, Bradley Manning um, and also uh, um, people like um, uh, Edward Snowden, um, who have you know struggled mightily to uh, to share um, kind of WikiLeaks style information with the American people about the nature of the secretive nature of what their government is doing. One of the stories um, that I think I've personally found very compelling is that of Jeremy Scahill's book um, called uh, uh, Dirty Wars, and it's a documentary as well, and I'm going to see if I can try to find a link for you guys to be able to watch that before you take your exam. Um, but uh, one um, key aspect that, that Jeremy Scahill focuses on is the rise of um, extrajudicial targeted assassination teams under Obama. Um, one key element is called JSOC, the uh, Joint Special Operations Command. It's an elite unit and that was centrally involved in the capture of bin Laden. Um, uh, but they have a highly problematic history because this is, as Dick Cheney says, you know, going to the dark side in terms of military activity, um, going off the books. Um, in Afghanistan, JSOC has been responsible for swooping down on homes in the middle of the night, uh, targeting uh, suspected terrorists, killing them, often along with the women and children that live there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is just, um, uh, you know, um, a, a problematic uh, 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 way of acting, you know, that's outside of the parameters of um, um, rules of engagement, the, the international rules of war um, govern how soldiers should uh, act and uh, killing civilians is not allowed, okay? Um, so that would be one quick rough summary of um, Obama's um, foreign policy. There's obviously much more that can be that can be said. If you guys are interested, I encourage you to take my foreign policy class or my globalization class, that's Politics 1500, um, or my international relations class, it's Politics 2500, and both of those uh, 1500 and 2500 are coming up next semester. I love teaching them and we cover a lot more of this kind of stuff in detail. Obviously time constraints today uh, limit us from uh, talking about it in detail, but I'd like to talk more about people like Bradley Manning and, um, and uh, Edward Snowden um, uh, with you in, in detail and WikiLeaks and things like that, Julian Assange, all these controversies and the Arab Spring and all this stuff. Um, there's so much going on in the world today, and um, it's a shame we can only talk about a small fragment of it. But that's the end of today's lecture anyway. Um, I've very much enjoyed uh, working with you guys this semester, and I, I would love to see you again. So thank you very much for your time, and um, good luck with the final exam.